we we use a simple by naive base classifier, and we classify it over uh, nine. And you can see from the graph um, that the height equals we uh, at around at thirty five uh, percent accuracy at around uh, seventy five uh, times the. Our main approach actually um, tried, as I said, to create a single classifier that can try to classify um, the, the, the uh, data set into um, the different um, uh, stimulus that was shown to them. So there were six classes that were uh, part of the stimulus. And to start with, we normalized the, the data. So we basically took the uh, means of all the answers, and we also divide, uh, we subtracted the uh, mean from each of them, and divided it by the standard deviation to normalize the data uh, across a uh, person. Um, then we try to incorporate the time as an ex uh, as a as a new attribute um, of the data set itself. Um, so that we could somehow use it uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that we could uh, easily classify it using a single uh, classifier. And so that, so we, since we had 128 electro data already, and uh, by adding this one prime elect, uh, attribute, we had total 129 uh, electro data. Uh, and and, and with, because we had 80 um, trials and 307 time steps, we had a total of uh, 147,360 little instances um, in our training data, uh, in our entire uh, data set, sorry, training data. Um, now we tried, we, we tried using four different uh, classifiers. Uh, we started with the random forest. Uh, and we also use decision trees, uh, naive based and stochastic gradient descent classifier. Uh, so most of it was done using scikit-learn uh, in front Python, and we also did uh, um, uh, cross validation for each of these. Um, so the result of our uh, work is shown in this chart here. Um, so the blue color uh, shows all the random forms, um, the classification. Accuracies, and uh, as you can see, the random forest uh, update all the other classifier um, in terms of uh, computation accuracy, um, uh, closely followed by the decision trees and value based and uh, SGDs. Um, so that is six minutes. And we can also see that in very clearly that for each of each of these classifiers. That the HD, the high density uh, data set, uh, clearly uh, is way more, way more um, easily classified and has a higher classification accuracy uh, than the LD1, LD2, LD3, or LD4 uh, uh, data So, some of the further work that we tried to, uh, that we think we have uh, thought about is um, of using a feature selection method. To try and understand which of the 128 electrons can be used um, to uh, understand which of the 128 electrons can be used uh, given an n number of electron uh, criteria uh, by, to get the closest attribute uh, that an HD uh, gives. And uh, because we easily map them um, back to the uh, location, that is also something that we want to look at. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to have to cut you off now. That's seven minutes. So we're, right. ready, we're ready for our next team. This is African Lions. Kigali, are you online? Can we, yes, we are. Great. Can we shift screens to the Kigali feed, please? Yes. You have to share your content with us. Can you see the slides? Well, we, we just had it, then it went away. So it showed up for about a second. Okay, um, just because we're gonna we're gonna move on to the next one. So, can you see the slides?
Uh, Kigali, we're going to wait. You guys are going to have a few more minutes to get this set up. We're going to go to the next presentation here, okay? So you get it sorted out, and we're moving on to team number one, Random Walkers. So you're hooked up here. Okay. So, hi. So our uh, team name is the Random Walkers, and we worked on the fourth data set, the BART data set. And what it basically comes down to is analyzing neural synapses. So to start out, I want to give just a look at the data. And so the data here consists of, of 10 neurons. And for each neuron, what we have is we have uh, a, a, a measurement of synapses. And so the interesting thing is that each one of these dots represents a synapse. And for each one of these synapses, we also measure various properties. So we know the area, the volume, the shape of, e of each one of these particular synapses. And so this, the top five synapses correspond to the autistic neurons, and the bottom five correspond to the non-autistic neurons. So this is just a look at the data. So what we're interested in here. Um, is, is, is a couple of different questions. So the first is that there's a theory that autistic uh, mice will have either more or less um, synapses. Um, the second thing we want to look at is there a spatial dis correlation between synapses and the synaptic properties. And the final thing we want to look at is did the synapse properties change as you move to different parts of the neuron? And then ultimately we want to put it all together to say can, can these synapses help us predict autism? So to answer the first question, what we wanted to look at is we wanted to look at um, what is the density of synapses. And, and the, the way we wanted to measure this is say for the surface area of, of a neuron, how many total synapses were there. And so on the top left here, you have uh, the raw data of just one of the neurons. And, but what we didn't actually have is we didn't know what the exact surface area was. So we wanted to approximate it. And what we assumed was that the surface area is going to be proportional to an estimate of volume of the neuron that we came up with. And so in order to estimate volume, what we said is we first we took a kernel density estimate of the neuron, which is shown in the second plot here. And then we took a level set of the kernel density estimate of, of the neuron. And this level set is going to be our estimate of the volume. And so we use this to compute the statistic for the five autistic neurons and the five non-autistic neurons. And what we saw is that the non-autistic neurons shown here have seemed to have a higher number density of synapses. And obviously, we only have five neurons each, so the, the, the power here isn't very high. But we, we ultimately, we want to get collect, do this analysis for more and more neurons, and whichever one comes higher, and maybe compare the complete distribution, not just the T statistic. The second question we looked at is, what is, how does the, what is the spatial correlation between um, these different synapses? And so what you, show, what you see here is that each one of these dots on the x-axis is, is the nearest neighbor. So for each one of the synapses for a particular neuron, each one of them has a nearest neighbor. And what we're showing is we're showing the, the, the correlation between the channel 2 intensity of the nearest neighbors. And what you can see here is that there does seem to be a spatial distribution between the, the nearest neighbors of, of our data sets. So you can see that the correlation between the, close, the, the, the synapses seems to decay as you get further and further away for the particular synapses. So this is the second thing we learned from the data set. Um, the final thing is where do these synapses occur on the neuron? And, and so if you think back to the first neuron site, what you saw is you had the center of the neuron is called the soma. And we wanna, what we want to say is how did these statistical properties of the synapses change as you move away from the soma? And so on the x-axis here is the distance from the center of the neuron. And on, on the, here you see the autistic cases. And what you, you can see is that as, as you move away from the center of the neuron, the ratio of the area of, to the volume of the synapses seems to be fairly constant and fairly high. And in the non-autistic cases, you see that it's the, 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 the value is, it varies, and it seems to change as you move along. So this is another thing we found that helped differentiate the autistic and the non-autistic neurons in our data set. Now, uh, actually, the final thing we found is that um, so what we did here is each one of these plots corresponds to one of the neurons. And, uh, and what we did is we said, what is the correlation between various of the synaptic properties uh, across the neurons? And what we found is that the correlation does seem to be, the, the, the pattern of correlation seems to be stable for, for each one of these neurons. It seems like the statistical properties of the synapses seem to be fairly constant, except for this neuron right here, BQM9. So what we found when we looked into BQM9 is that it seems like this data set, this neuron seems to be sort of, sort of an anomaly. Um, and what you can see here, in the, on the lower thing, you see the distributions of, of, the, the, of the particular synapse property for all the other neurons compared to BQM9. And in particular, on, on the far left here, you see that the area 
of, of the BQM9 statistic, there seems to be a lot of zeros here. And we said, okay, well, there's, there's a lot of zeros here for BQM9. Maybe we should try to remove this data from our analysis. Maybe it's an anomaly. It's not going to help us look at our overall relationship. So to summarize, we actually had email over the course of the data set. Uh, the, our collaborator, uh, the Barth group emailed us an unlabeled neuron. So we don't actually know right now whether it's autistic or non-autistic. But what we did is, is we, we fit a, a random forest um, model with some of these variables that we found are important. We did leave one out cross-validation where the leave one out corresponds to one of the neuron. We dropped the anomalous data set and we got seven out of our nine predictions um, right. And so we don't know the answer to this yet, but we're predicting that the unlabeled neuron is autistic. Okay, so that's what we got, so thank you. The which one? The area to This one? compute these ratios? To compute these ratios? Well, so each one of these synapses has a as an area and a volume, right? And we just took the ratio of the area to the volume. It's just by synapse, not by neuron. Yeah, just by synapse. So this is for each one of the dots in, in the first slide. And this is just as you move away from and, and the, the Barth group gave us the center of the neuron, so we know where the center is for each one. And earlier when you were computing the areas, uh, you were using uh, to basically this one? Basically backwards, back, back, back. Here? Right. So what is the kernel you use to compute the ratio of the geologic? I think column of specific, is it a Gaussian kernel? The, for the, yes. Yeah, a Gaussian kernel. And a plug in estimator for the, for the covariance, or the bandwidth, yeah. What, what features did you use for the prediction? We used area, ellipticity, uh, I can just pull it up. So we used distance from the center, because we saw there was something there, ellipticity, area, and, vo and volume. So ellipticity is some measure of the shape of the, of the synapse. So now that you've committed to a prediction, can we Yeah, can we reveal <laughs> We think it's autistic. Like Don't say if it's wrong. Oh, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there might be others. <laughs> right, 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 yeah. Right, 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 right. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Can we get your computer up here? This is team number two. Thank you very much. Is it on here? It's my computer. Oh, this is your computer. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. I do want to use my. Um, no, I want the next yeah. team. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Okay. Just a reminder to everybody to upload your slides to Box with your team name, your final slides, please. You want me to talk through this? I do. I'm pretty loud. It's a for taping. For taping. Yeah. Do you need help? There you go. Okay. Hope everyone got some sleep. Um, location, location, location. So we took uh, um, the EEG data set and um, tried to look at why electrodensity matters. So hopefully you can get this really quickly since we don't have a lot of time. I'll wait for something. OK. So <clears throat> a reminder of what the data set is. Um, so basically, uh, this is the EEG data set where the uh, subjects are presented with these uh, various gradients here that you see on the left. And they have different densities. So they go from uh, low to high there. This generates a, a very characteristic rotonotopic map. It's understood that these stimuli are not natural, but we're going to see what we can learn about the brain Anyways, so the subjects are, uh, have these EEG uh, electrodes on them, and um, we record the, the, or the signal is recorded from, the electrical signal. They're oriented in this uh, uh, map up, uh, up on top there, and there's 
the high density grid, I'm not going to go, this isn't a lot of details, you already heard it, but there's uh, the high density grid, which has 128 electrodes, a low density grid with um, 32 electrodes. Um, these are the matrix sizes, basically it's 128 by 307 by 480 um, for 16 subjects. <clears throat> so basically we wanted to know, uh, does, uh, is there more information essentially in the um, higher density electrodes? And if that's the case, like how is this information distributed? Where is it spatially distributed and so on? So our approach was to first replicate the existing analysis with the linear classifier that you, uh, you saw a little bit of in the first presentation. And then we, were, we would try to apply uh, feature selection. We were going to also use, a, or we're going to use an SVM um, to see if we can do better uh, with that classifier. And then really we want to look at the spatial information. So those two approaches don't necessarily have anything to do with spatial information. They're just time. And so we're going to look at spatial information. We're going to adopt a technique that's used in fMRI called representational similarity analysis. And then we're also going to do selective feature selection, um, <clears throat> again, looking at how the uh, um, information is represented. We also are going to implement a, a convolutional neural network, um, at least try to see if that works, um, which takes into account the spatial information. And overall here, we're a little less interested in just classifier accuracy, making our classifier better than we are in uh, the model, which is a model having to do with spatial information. So uh, we <clears throat> first replicated the linear classification, and the key here is that so our accuracy is on the y-axis and the x-axis is time. You see a spike. That's when the information hits the back of the head um, <clears throat> where V1 is, so primary visual cortex. Um, so this is the high-density array, and this is just kind of for sanity. You also see this like oscillating pattern that's oscillating at 15 hertz, which is the, um, uh, the uh, frequency that the stimulus is rotating at. Um, so in general, the relationship between time and accuracy is as expected. Uh, so then we tried an SVM. We got a lot better accuracies with the, uh, the SVM. Um, and <clears throat> overall, this, we got uh, much higher accuracies at, with the higher density electrodes compared to the lower density electrodes. And this would be consistent with more information being coded in the uh, higher density array. It was consistent, appears to be heavily consistent on, apparently I ran out of time, heavily consistent on um, cross-validation scheme. So we, we used 80% uh, uh, here, if you use K-fold, they drop a little, <clears throat> but moving on. So we looked at the accuracies as a function of how many features were needed to get some accuracy minus epsilon. And uh, we really didn't need a lot of features. So we have 128 electrodes. And here, even with like 10 electrodes at peak accuracy, we do um, pretty well. <clears throat> we then looked at uh, sort of the spatial map of feature selection. So on the x-axis, you're seeing time. On the y-axis, you're seeing normalized um, the electrodes sorted according to distance, so further from the fovea location. Um, in the back of the brain. And basically, at a, a little bit before 100 uh, time stamps, you see this sort of increase in um, number of features that are needed. But there doesn't really appear to be much there. <clears throat> we also looked at uh, sort of the representational structure of the um, uh, different classes and how they were oriented. So at the back of the brain, this is where sort of the fovea would be represented. We get this um, a representational dissimilarity matrix, which is the distance between each class label. And um, it's projected in, with colors. And there's very clear structure um, wh where you would expect sort of highest accuracy. Um, but there's also clear structure way outside. So like way back here, um, <clears throat> perhaps where you wouldn't expect to find as high of a uh, structure. What is, it? is it six minutes or seven minutes? Six for questions. Yeah, we have to stop at six for questions. Stop at six for questions. OK, I'm going to go very quickly. Um, so we next looked at, again, sort of like trying to get to the, the, the spatial question. We looked at the, can you guys see this? Or can we turn off the lights, maybe? So these are correlation matrices for each electrode um, cross-validated across subjects. So basically, uh, uh, the electrodes are rank ordered by distance. So you see, hopefully, um, you can see sort of like a big red block in the left, uh, the first quadrant, and a smaller block in the right quadrant. And this is consistent with. <clears throat> the orientation of the electrodes. So this is the left block, or sorry, quadrant one block, and these sides are quadrant four. <clears throat> and so the, 
these are, the signals coming from here are very highly correlated, and the signals coming from here are very highly correlated. They're not very highly correlated with one another. So again, there's very clear spatial separation. This is, um, I'm going to skip in the interest of time. Um, we next use a convolutional neural network to see if we could get um, sort of better accuracy, but more importantly, accuracy that was contingent on the spatial, the, the spatial information. So the, the convolutional neural network was trained with um, an X by Y array of where the electrodes were oriented in space, um, and then the signals from those. We didn't get great accuracy, so we tried a bunch of different uh, uh, network architectures. I'm showing you this just, uh, just uh, in case you're curious. We tried a bunch of different networks, but didn't get uh, that high of accuracies overall, probably because we have uh, very limited data. Um, so in conclusion, uh, we could probably do some hyperparameter tuning to get better accuracies, but again, we were sort of more interested in the spatial question. Um, the data is consistent, though, with the higher density array having um, carrying increased information, um, and it's less consistent with the lower density array carrying um, equal information. But neural data appears is still complicated. So thank you to uh, all the faculty and sponsors who made this happen, and that's it. So the um, so you have oh do you want me to keep this on? It's time. So the electrode is a feature. So, so it's 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 over space. Yes. Yes. So you didn't try doing anything with like Fourier analysis to get. Um, no, we thought about that, but again, we were more interested in the spatial question. Than the frequency domain. Okay. Why, why would we Alright, we have our next team now. This is team um, three, multi brain bandits, is that right? Yes. Alright. Okay. Um, are you a morning person or an evening person? Uh, we were looking at Sandra Coleman's uh, data set, and we're interested in uh, the influence of internal behavioral state on visual processing. Uh, we are multi-brain bandits, and uh, we have data from one mice uh, who was uh, placed on a virtual reality set, sort of like he was looking at a video, and there were multiple scenes presented to him. Um, and this was recorded in uh, 5 a.m. and 5 p.m. Uh, quickly to summarize the results, um, we looked at uh, data from primary visual cortex and we found that there are signatures of different arousal states present there. Uh, we looked at the behavioral uh, information as well and we found that there's more arousal at 5 p.m. compared to 5 a.m. And um, consequently, we observed that uh, the visual uh, area um, also show um, a consistent results for the mean response of the cells, stimulus condition, noise correlation, stimulus decoding, angle between neural spaces, and also differences um, for the neural trajectories. Uh, this was just to look a little bit at the behavior, and we look at the pupil size of of the mice as it was uh, looking at the screen. And uh, we can see that at 5 p.m. Uh, his eyes are fully dilated, uh, which uh, it gives us some pointers as to the animal is quite aroused. And um, furthermore, to talk a little bit about the data, uh, we were given data from different layers, two different layers. Um, and this is uh, an area of 500 micrometers by 500 micrometers, and there's a separation of about 125 micrometers uh, in height. And um, we have uh, AM and PM in the rows in here, and we have plotted, uh, identified by color in here, which one was the favorite stimulus for those cells. And we have laid them on the space, and we don't see any particular spatial um, configuration um, that is sensitivity. Um, it was very important for us 
to be able to track cells, and this is one thing that I want to emphasize. Um, we looked at, uh, because we noticed that AM and PM data sets were collected on different dates. Um, so we looked at tracking the cells, um, and we did this in a heuristic. I can go into details. It's a difficult problem. We didn't want to focus on it. But we found a heuristic to be able to track the cells uh, for, so that we could compare uh, more readily AM and PM. Um, the first uh, measure of comparison that we looked was at the mean response uh, between AM and PM. And from here, uh, we didn't see uh, statistical significance, but we did see the trend that for PM there was um, higher levels of mean response. Um, we next looked at the mean response, but this time separated by each uh, uh, of the conditions that we had. So this is sort of like a tuning curve of sorts. Um, and we're looking at the stimulus conditioning with a very simple measure. It's used what's the variability of this tuning curve. Um, so how much is modulating? And um, I have data from both planes in here, plane one and plane two. These are the two layers, uh, different heights. And we do observe also that there is uh, many cells of these ones that we're tracking uh, show more modulation uh, for uh, PM uh, compared to AM. Uh, we looked at uh, noise correlations, and um, the effects were actually a little bit smaller for this and more localized to a few of the conditions, uh, as seen in Manhattan and uh, one of the things of pink noise. Um, moving on, we wanted to do something with the population, uh, so we uh, tested classification uh, decoding, we wanted to decode between these uh, four conditions, and we found that there's better decoding accuracy uh, with the PM um, uh, data versus AM. So that's what we're showing here. And um, we also fitted a factor uh, uh, model, uh, to, and we looked at the dimensionality for a subspace of uh, three. And um, we looked at the angles between these two subspaces. So there's one subspace fitted to AM and another one to PM. And when we looked at the angles, between, at the principal angles, we do see a difference here um, uh, in the first principal angle uh, between AM and PM. Uh, so that was very interesting to us as, as it indicates that these two subspaces are very different actually, and it's something that we can only see at the population level. Um, very hard to track, as we have seen by individual levels. Uh, next thing, we wanted to do something with time because the simplified data set that we were given uh, was actually just a summary of all 1.5 seconds presented uh, when the stimulus is on. So we went back and looked at the raw data and we extracted um, uh, each one of the time steps which corresponds to about 130 milliseconds. Uh, we smoothed that response um, and just for reference, this is the uh, deconvolved uh, signal. Um, and uh, here I'm showing the comparison just for one of the planes and one of the conditions, and this is between AM and PM. And you can see that each one of these is a cell, and the general pattern is that PM is, uh, it's got a higher level of uh, fluorescence. Um, but we wanted to summarize this, um, so we plotted the neural trajectories. Um, and so here I'm showing a neural trajectory is fitted for both planes of data. So I combined the cells and um, we can see that uh, the PM uh, condition, it's, uh, it's uh, reaching and there's like more differences in the neural trajectories that we can observe. It's, it's covering more of the uh, subspace. Uh, so the impact that we want to highlight uh, in the application is that um, it would be good to keep track of cells between AM and PM, uh, as this will be helpful for multidimensional analysis. Um, also, the neural trajectories incorporating time into the mix, as in a population that evolves over time, might be something to look at for further analysis. Um, so that's it. Thank you.
So the colors seem off, but okay. And I just leave this here. And at the population level, we can identify individually with the All right, we have our next team, which is team four. Great, take it away. Hi, uh, we're the unsupervised neuro junkies, and there's going to be a lot of overlap because we chose the same data set and some uh, similar analyses, but we really wanted to dive deeply into the scientific questions. So the title of the uh, summary is an exploration of circadian rhythms and cortical depths. So just to give you like the tiniest bit of background, what is known is that layer four, the deeper layer, gets the actual thalamic input. So you should see some sort of differences in the wiring but on, on the, in between uh, cortical depths. And then there's been very preliminary work on uh, what, how circadian rhythms affect uh, this sensory cortex and barrel co cortex, but there's so many open questions. Uh, so unlike the last group, since we had no guarantee that the neurons are the same from the data set to data set, we're worried about uh, actually making stuff on individual neuron levels. So we start, decided to look at uh, analyses on the level of populations of neurons. OK, so uh, as Jose really touched on, one of the first things we notice is, OK, these uh, global population response means don't really discriminate the two stimuli. Sorry, I'm going to go pretty quickly here. But uh, the global response to the Manhattan stimulus is significantly larger, regardless of time of day or depth in cortex. So you're going to notice this trend in uh, my slides where I'm really trying to pick out features that are true on one dimension but invariant to other differences. Now, uh, OK. There's been some really cool work on how the mouse becomes fatigued over the course of an experiment. So uh, we wanted to look at whether this idea of fatigue or familiarity or whatever you want to call this uh, decay in, over the course of a uh, presentation block, uh, or sorry, a series of presentation blocks, whether that is the same from uh, the drowsy state or the alert state. And we find that, as a matter of fact, um, in the awake state, there's uh, a higher initial level of uh, responsiveness, and uh, there's, as a result of that, you also see a larger slope in terms of the magnitude of the slope in terms of a decrease as the uh, experiment proceeds. Uh, furthermore, this is actually, I've only shown you pink noise one in Manhattan here just for space reasons, but this is true across all stimuli. Uh, again, uh, we also look, decided to look at noise correlations. Uh, here, uh, if you aren't familiar with noise correlations, it's a way where you subtract away the uh, average response uh, to the presented stimuli. And uh, we notice, again, it varies the choice of stimuli. Noise correlation itself gives you the information to discriminate cortical depth, which would be the comparison between uh, the plane one on, if you number these um, from one to four, it would be one and three are plane one, and two and four are plane two. So the comparison would be one and uh, two. And then you also can uh, discriminate uh, circadian phase, which would be uh, the 5 AM versus 5 PM. Uh, and what's actually charted on the y-axis here is uh, the cutoff of 2.5 standard deviations of the noise correlation. Now, we wanted to overlay. These noise correlations are a measure of functional connectivity. So we want to overlay this on the actual spatial information. Uh, from This is just the 5 PM plane 1 data set. And uh, one thing you can notice uh, related to the fact that Manhattan had that higher uh, overall response, it also evokes this denser connectivity. And uh, uh, this is a, the 5 a.m. plane 2, which is now going to be the drowsiest state. You see the fewest long range within the uh, viewing window connections. Um, and uh, this is, again, just visualizing the density of the sort of cortical circuits. 
So from there, we decided to look at uh, another thing that could be sort of related to the idea of these this uh, circuit constraints is uh, dimensionality reduction. Uh, instead of doing, we did a probabilistic principal component analysis because this data set was shaped in a way where you're stimuli limited, where you have four stimuli, but you have tons of trials. So that's a different way of spanning these uh, response manifolds. And uh, there, that uh, 5 a.m. plane 2 data set I showed you has uh, the gentlest eigenspectra, and that actually correlates to the fact that it has the fewest long-range uh, connections in the cortical circuits. Uh, finally, this is just um, some preliminary work, but we've actually seen that uh, the tuning properties of the neurons uh, change with the time of day, but not across layers. So again, uh, thinking about ways to decode both uh, the, layer, the layer you're recording from and the time of day uh, using different feature sets and invariant cell layer. Uh, that's our slides. And I'd like to thank uh, the providers of the data sets and the organizers of the hackathon and all of my team members. So questions? Right, so noise correlation is based on the relationships of neurons after you've subtracted away the average response. So it's like co-fluctuations around yeah. their average, yeah. And then all of the other ones were just sort of average response over some time period. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yes. Yes. OK, so first I line up this uh, covariance matrix. Then I subtract away. Uh, basically, you can think of it as a PSTH, but in this case, it's the average response across the presentation stimuli. Um, that leaves me with a residual covariance matrix. And then from that residual matrix, I'm going to uh, basically vectorize that into uh, pairs. And then since each pair of neuron defines an entry, I can then map that onto the same spatial coordinates to examine the actual spatial pattern of the noise correlation matrix. Is that the whole slide? It's not the whole slide. OK, you show me how to do it. Um, I've no idea how to do it here. So does it have a? Yeah. Here you go. There you go. Great. It's still half. Um, Is there a presenter mode in? Full screen mode. That's what we did, right? Mm. Oh, okay. cool. Great. Thanks. Great. So, hi everyone. We're deep brain stimulation. Um, so, we also worked on the 5 a.m. versus 5 p.m. data set that some people already described. Uh, here we present the main questions that were given, that were provided in the initial presentation of the data set. Um, and the main, I guess, primary question is whether there is difference in neural activity between 5 a.m. and 5 p.m in the mice where those experiments were recorded. Um, there were a few hypotheses that were presented. Um, and then another question was whether the neural code is more sparse in the morning. So in our work, we tried to answer all of those questions, one after the other. So we're going to go through the results. Now, initially, we started by looking at the histogram of the data uh, between 5 AM and 5 PM. <laughs> so this is just the histogram of the intensities of the neural activities um, for the two different times. and we don't seem to see any difference in those, any significant difference in those two plots. So 
What we did next was to plot um, a cumulative density function. Basically, we look at the fraction of neurons that have activation higher than a particular threshold the time, and we keep increasing that threshold. And we look at the two times, 5 a.m. and 5 p.m. And this is the fraction of neurons as you increase that threshold. So we see that initially all neurons are active, and as we increase the threshold, the number of neurons decreases. Um, the red plot is the, the red line corresponds to 5 p.m. And the confidence interval is a 95% confidence interval um, that we compute using bootstrapping. So here we see that there does seem to be some sig small but significant difference in activity between 5 p.m. and 5 a.m. So the next step that we tried was to try to see if we can actually discriminate between the two. So we decided to build a classifier that, given the neural activities, we tried to decide whether that corresponds to 5 a.m. or 5 p.m. And the data that we were provided are recorded over different uh, planes in the brain of the mice. Um, and each plane has a different number of neurons that it records. Uh, so we decided to extract features from those data. And what we started with is aggregate features over those neurons. So we looked at statistics like the max, the mean, the median of the intensity values over the different neurons. Um, and we also use those features, the fractions uh, of neurons above different values for the thresholds that we saw earlier that seem to be different. Um, and the actual thresholds we use are uh, between 0 and 1, 100 different values. And those provided different features. So this allows us to apply various standard machine learning methods for classification. And we tried a few of them. Um, and what's interesting to see is that even with an out-of-the-box like random forest classifier with those features gives us 98% classification accuracy. Um, and this is uh, estimated using five-fold cross-validation. And to verify that result, we also tried like different number of folds and randomization, and it still gave the same performance. It was like higher than 95% all the time. So this gives very strong evidence that there is a difference in neural activity between 5 a.m. and 5 p.m. Um, and we decided to try and find out what that difference is. So initially, we looked at, as we vary the number of neurons that we are looking at, how the classification performance changes. Here, what we did is we randomly sample um, a different number of neurons. We started at just one neuron up to 200 neurons. Um, and we ran the whole experiment by just using the intensities of those neurons as features directly. And then we resample. We repeat this many times. And then we take the average uh, performance. And we're looking at if we isolate the features provided from just some of the stimuli that were presented to the mice, um, one of the four scenes, or all of them together. And what we see is that even with 100 neurons, we can uh, achieve classification accuracy higher than 95% when we use all the stimuli. And when we use either one of the stimuli alone, we achieve a high accuracy, not as high, but it doesn't really matter which stimulus we pick. It's just the combination of them that gives us better performance. So um, since we've seen that the distribution seems to be different, the data seems to be different for the two times, we decided to do a two-sample test for the two data sets. So we have samples, observations from the 5 a.m. and samples of the region from 5 p.m. And we want to do a test, a statistical test, to figure out if those two samples come from the same distribution. Um, I'm not going to go through details for the test we use, but we use a non-parametric test to figure out whether the two, sets of data, uh, two samples of data come from different distributions. Um, and we found out that um, the, this, this basically shows us, so we again repeat this experiment over just looking at different subsets of neurons, just one neuron or two or five or 10. Um, and when we repeat the experiment over different subsets, we see how many times we accept the hypothesis that the distributions are the same. So we start with one neuron. We see that we accept it like ranging from 20% of the time to 5% of the time. But once we get to like two neurons or more, we start like rejecting it all the time. So it seems that the distributions are different. Um, and we see that the noise, if we look only at the noise stimuli, we need more neurons to, to achieve that like rejection rate. Um, we also repeated this experiment uh, by observing the, whether the um, samples from the different stimuli come from different distributions. So we look at the observations, the recordings we have from different stimuli. And we look at the difference between uh, 5 AM and 5 PM and the combined performance. And we see that the best performance is obtained when we look at just 5 PM. So basically. This says that at 5 p.m., it's easier to distinguish between the stimuli. Um, that's with 95% confidence, uh, the statistical test. So then we decided to look what is different about the distributions. Um, and we looked at 
um, we look at the marginal activity of the mean, the marginal mean activity of the neurons, and that seemed to be Gaussian distributed, but slightly skewed. Um, what we do is we assume it's Gaussian and we fit um, Gaussian model, a different Gaussian model for each stimuli and time. Um, and we obtain maximum likelihood estimates for the means and variances. Here we plot the means for the different stimuli. Um, these are ordered based on the forest stimuli from high to low. We see that it seems to be heavy tailed, the distribution. Um, but this is AM and PM, and we see that there doesn't seem to be a significant difference between them. Uh, we also plot with different order, and we pretty much observe the same thing. And then we did a statistical test uh, to look at whether the mean variances, uh, skewness, and kurtosis of those samples, of those means, actually differ, are different. And we weren't able to um, get a statistically strong, strong result. Um, so that says that basically this parametric model is not sufficient to describe those differences. Um, but there still are differences based on our previous test. So then, um, oh, one uh, side result is that the fitted, we plotted the fitted distribution for the neurons for the means. And this shows that there exist like neurons like this outlier that are perfect for particular stimuli. Like this is perfect for classifying whether it's a forest stimulus or not. So we have to stop here. OK. I'm sorry. Ah. Anyway, okay. This is the I final slide. <laughs> We're going to get our off-site teams on the screen, and we have one more team to present. So let's thank everybody who's just done a great job presenting. Thank you. Take 15 minutes and have some refreshments, and we're going to finish off. What time lunch. is everybody getting back? Exactly. So at um, 4:40, we're going to resume. Hey guys, hi Lita. Hello, Bruce Obishka. Okay. All right, so thanks everybody for your patience. We're gonna have three more presentations. Um, and so you will have seven minutes. I recommend keeping it to six so you have one minute for questions. And you can go ahead now. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Victor, and we have my teammates, Agre, Hillary, and Lena. So we work on the Shan3 data set. And we're really interested in seeing uh, if we could uh, classify. So we had 10 uh, neurons from 10, data from 10 neurons. And uh, wanted to see if we could classify the genotype of a neuron based on synaptic fluorescent properties that we were given data sets. So really, that's what uh, we were interested in. And it's, it's an interesting question. Because as uh, Alison said, she said that this data has not really been collected before, so really this, this endeavor is something that is, that is going to uh, be groundbreaking if, if uh, it can achieve it. So we're also, we also, we also interested in looking at uh, if you're giving two pairs of like, synaptic, synaptic information, like, can we predict the probability of it being uh, a mutant or a wild type neuron? So, as with a lot of machine learning endeavors, we thought that first step look at the data to sort of understand uh, the data and see like, what features were really important. And uh, so, we, did, we initially did uh, linear discriminant uh, analysis. We did a lot of feature engineering. And we also did a principal component analysis. I wanted to see like what what the number of components, uh, what what's the degree of uh, what number of components explains the variance more. And so we did a PCA and then we plotted the number of components and the explained variance ratio to see. So the thing is like the data is not is not really. Uh, linearly separable, and we're using like synapse data from uh, from a single neuron as a single data point. And the other trend was like the data was multidimensional, although we felt still that discriminative models might might be better for classification in this in this case. So really, much of what we we're doing was trying to play with uh, the features and trying to trying to come up with components that that we could uh, really use to to perform our classification. And so, also,
so we, we did a lot of clustering to sort of understand the patterns in the data. And uh, we also computed like covariance and uh, information on data. But this, this was not really very helpful because, well, it was pretty stable across the neurons, but it wasn't really giving us any information to make a strong prediction on about the uh, genotype of that neuron. But then we, we eventually built the classifier using uh, logistic regression. And with this simple classifier, we were able to get up to 70% um, accuracy. But then we're particularly more interested in how can we build a, a really, really good, um, how can we how can build a really good feature of components. And one of the advantages of convolutional neural network is that they can, like, they can learn the appropriate features themselves automatically. And so we decided, okay, we're going to actually uh, use a CNN to perform the classification as well. Although we're really constrained by the amount of data that we had, uh, we did that, and uh, we were able to, uh, we were able to get 50% um, accuracy on the data. So the data is in triangular format. So what we did was we had to sort of like slice data into into uh, into, uh, into uh, smaller formats, making them squares, and pass them to uh, a simple uh, CNN. I, I guess from from our from our work so far, what we've really been able to uh, pick out from this is like the features are important, and there's not really a single feature in that data set that or even combinations of features uh, linearly that can really tell whether the, the synaptic uh, information from the neuron uh, is, tells us it's, it's the wild, wild, um, wild type or it's actually a mutant. But we feel like convolutional neural networks can, can really help with uh, solving this, this uh, feature problem and learning features and and really finding the hidden, hidden um, patterns in, in mutant synaptic information. And we're, we're, we're looking to explore this further. But so far, that's what we've done, and we're grateful for the opportunity to work on data sets. Are we ready for the next presentation now, Alison? Okay, if there are no other questions, let's go forward. Okay, we'll, uh, just let Will get behind you and we'll get the screen up um, for our Team Vicious and Delicious. So this is one of our Doha teams and they videotape their presentation. So we have sound and slides that will be coming from up front here. Jack, just turn just, around. Right. Sorry, Josh. And Andreas. It'll, it'll be good. You tell me when you're ready, Will. And I'll... Guys, um, this is Team Vicious and Delicious, and along with my six, uh, sorry, four or five <laughs> team members, we're going to be presenting to you the BART dataset. 
Um, when we first looked at this data set, we decided that we wanted to ask three questions. Which features are important? Which features vary together? And what's the overall structure of the data? Uh, namely, where are the feature dependency in the, in the data? Uh, first of all, we looked at which features are important. For that, we used different classifiers. We used the linear SVM, logistic regression, and random forests. So the SVM and regression fit a hyperplane to the data. So the coefficient of the hyperplane describe a vector that's perpendicular to it. Uh, hence, the larger the coefficient of a feature, the closer the hyperplane is to the axis, and the more significant the feature is. Um, in a random forest, at every level, we choose to split the data along the feature that decreases the impurity the most. The amount of impurity that we reduce by splitting the data along a particular feature can be thought of as the, the importance of the feature. So we assume that the weights assigned to the features in each of these classifiers are the, what, what we want to look at, are the importance of the feature. Of course, we normalized um, and we averaged over five folks. So the, the, first, the, the results that we got from the classifiers, we used the scores that we obtained to rank the features according to their significance. And as we can see here, for example, the sphericity is the most significant feature separating between the wild type and the mutated genome. Um, next, we looked at what features depend on each other. Uh, which pairs of features vary together. So we wanted to find a structure in the data and observe the dependencies that get affected by the mutation. So first of all, uh, we looked at all the pairs of features in the wild type data set and calculated the mutual um, inf information between them. In the graph um, that, you, you, that you see, we illustrated five most interdependent features. The blue bars are am the amount of interdependence on a um, scale from 0 to 0 0.5 between all the features in the wild type data set. Along with that, as you can see, there is a green, or you might see it as yellow, line, which describes the amount of interdependence between the heterozygote features to show that the dependencies vary a lot from one data set to another. Um, here, we did the same. But we're showing in yellow the five highest dependencies among the features in the heterozygote data set. Um, if we look at the pairs of features, standard deviation intensity and the number of vertices, we can see that the dependency becomes um, much higher when we look at the mutant genes, which could potentially mean that um, in the case of the mutant gene, there is a greater variance in the intensity of the synaptic events. Finally, we used the Cho Liu algorithm to build a probabilistic model that represents dependencies among the variables and shows the overall structure of the data. As you can see here, we have a tree which describes the dependencies on the heterozygote data set. For example, if we look at uh, the intensity sum 2, we can notice that it gets affected um, by a lot of variables. And in, in, in turn, it change, a change in the intensity sum two only affects the geometric aspect of the synapses. Looking at the, now at the tree that represents dependencies among the variables or the features in the wild type, we notice that the intensity deviation, uh, sorry, standard deviation one, is related to almost all the variables. The tree is fairly simple, which um, might show that there is a there are um, few interdependencies between the features in the case of the wild type mice. Um, the relatively complicated structure of the graph in the case of the heterozygote mice indicates that the features are more dependent. Um, these are our results. Thank you very much. <laughs> Who do we have next, Alice? Um, we have team 10. So um, I have a Skype ID. Let me just see if we can say this. Team 10. Just in case. Do you have a Mac?
the team nine you're now presenting, right? Um. So should I start now? Thank you. Um, so hello everyone. Today we're going to present this project. We are Team 10. The name is pretty interesting on this slide. So <laughs> we're composed of six people. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yeah. And we also choose this like 5, 5 AM, 5 PM data set. This, uh, first, let me briefly explain the experimental data. We, uh, this experiment is conducted of the visual stimulus to mice. It's conducted in two different sections. The first one is 5 a.m. And it is said that the 5 a.m. is the light period, so the mouse is sleepy at that time. And at 5 p.m., the mouse in the dark period is awake, so it's opposite of human beings. And we do the experiments to um, the visual stimuli are four different videos. The first one is the forest, like rolling in the forest. The second one is the city, Manhattan. And the fourth, third and fourth are pink noises. And we have four videos. Each video has 16 trials, and each trial 17 rep repeats. So there's a large amount of data for this. And after the, each test, we cut two plants of the mice to take to use the calcium sensor flustering response to detect the segmented neuron response. So it, if we test the strong response, it means that the neuron is active to this video stimuli. And these two different plants, actually, I'm not quite sure what, what is the like, biological meaning of these two different plants. So we just go ahead and analyze the results. Uh, our goal is to figure out like, how the neurons behave differently at these two different time points. So first, we analyze the sensitivity of this data at two different points. So first, we just uh, calculate the average values, the average values of each cell at the same test. At the same test, we have 272 different repeats for each test. So we just get the average value for each cell at different conditions. Like here, we show each condition on the x-axis, like the neuron, the movie one at 5 p.m. or, or movie one at 5 a.m. And let's compare these pairs individually. For example, at the left side, the, for the movie, one is in the forest at 5 a.m. And compared to the one close to it at 5 p.m., we can see that uh, more neurons response at 5 p.m. than at 5 a.m. And we divided this response into three different categories. Just want to see that are there more in the, in the neurons that respond more actively or more in the ones that have low response? And the result shows that almost all neurons respond more actively at 5 p.m. than 5 a.m. And especially this in higher mag magnitude response and in both planes, so uh, which proves that the mouse at 5 p.m. are more active than at 5 a.m. And here is also, we also plot this density plot. But here the axis is the intensity of the response, and the y-axis is the density of the cells. So at the peak area, which shows the majority of the neuron cells, they uh, respond at this magnitude. And if we compare two time points, for example, for example, the plan one, the blue blue line shows the plan the response at 5 a.m. at for plan one, and the yellow, um, yeah, and the yellow one shows the the response at 5 p.m. plan one, and it's obviously that the majority of the response have a larger number than the blue ones, so which shows that the, there are more neurons response at 5 p.m. than 5 a.m., and they're also c consistent with the individual histograms. And another question is, we would like to know the selectivity of, of the, new, the mouse react to different videos at two different time points. Uh, the idea is that maybe the mouse at 5 
AM is a little bit sleepy, so some videos cannot stimulate the mouse, but if it's awake, then all different stimulus can make the mouse active. So we would like to see if is this the truth. Here we calculate the average response of every cell, and as you can see the, on the top one, the matrix, here we, we use each row represent one movie and each column represent one cell and the, all the repeats are calculated so we use the average value to represent each cell for each movie and we calculate the index of dispersion for each cell which this index means that uh, they respond differently to four different movies. So if this index is pretty large, that means it varies a lot, so the mouse reacts differently to different videos. But if this index is slow or close to zero, which means that they, these movies have no difference, they, they stimulate the same reaction. So we plot this on these two different plans. On this side, on the left side is the plan one, and on the right side is the plan too. As we can see in the plan one, the, the, at the, the index of this person at 5 p.m. is they have more neurons react at close to zero and less and less at the more larger index of depression, which means that the mice at 5 p.m. are less selective than the ones at 5 a.m., which consistent with our hypothesis. But for the plan B, we actually cannot figure out any differences, but um, that we, we might need to like, figure out what is the difference between these two plans. But we cannot get such data knowledge right now. So yeah, that's all for our analysis. Actually, we tried a lot of like, new machine learning methods like SVM or, or the CM. We can get high accuracy of this data, but actually we cannot extract any useful biological meaning for our results. So we just present this. Thank you. Okay, okay, sure. So, so this one, like, like we have the data. Uh, for example, I, I just explained for plan one. We have a we have the data for for a certain number of cells. Let's say three hundred and one cells. It respected differently to four dif four different movies. So we have all this data, and we calculate the mean value of each cell respond to a certain type of movie, and then we can calculate the the this the index of dispersion is the variance of these four numbers over the mean of these four numbers. If all four numbers, let's say just one, if all of them are one, then the variance is zero, so the index of dispersion is zero, which means that the cell reacts the same to different movies. But if this variance is pretty large, then we will get the larger index of dispersion, and then which means that this cell dis responds differently to different movies. So if we consider the results of plan one, it's actually the truth that some cells respond differently to different movies at two different time points. And if your orange is 5P and blue is 5A, I can't quite remember. Oh, sorry, yeah, orange is 5 p.m. and the blue is 5 a.m.
some swag to give out, compliments of Google um, and Dance and Neuroscience. Um, we also have some Brain Hub uh, gifts to give you too. So um, our judges now will deliberate and uh, we'll just wait for a little bit and look at what we've got. Okay, okay excellent. All right, so let me just start off by saying I want to thank our judges for their time in both listening to the presentations and also looking through the code um, and all their difficult deliberations here. So let's give a round of applause. All right, so without further ado, we're going to announce our third, second, and right, first place winners. We're going to do it in reverse winners. order. That's and, right. Uh, so take it away. Yeah, so um, thanks, everybody. I want to uh, take some time as well to thank everybody who participated. We were really amazingly impressed with uh, all of the cool stuff that everybody did. Um, I want to particularly thank our uh, remote teams who uh, showed uh, a dedication above and beyond the call for um, working and, you know, it's well past midnight there at this point, right? And so, um, uh, you know, thanks, thanks to them and thanks to everybody. So uh, good job. All right, and so our third place team uh, is, uh, drum roll, uh, team one, who is uh, the random walkers. So if we want to bring a team one representative up here. All right, uh, I can. We, we don't have a certificate to give you, but we do have some brain hub laser pointers oh, that we would like to give you. Team number three, team one, in third place. So, please. Thanks. All right. Enjoy. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. 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 And so um, we, were, uh, we were very impressed with um, several things that Team One did. Uh, first, the, um, uh, the use of a, the discovery that a, a novel measure of synaptic density was useful in distinguishing the wild type from the um, uh, heterozygous uh, mice. Um, they were the only team that um, uh, identified and removed an anomalous neuron from this data. So kudos for actually checking your work. Um, uh, and you were the only team that was brave enough to predict on held out data. <laughs> Even though the prediction was ultimately wrong, we want to give you credit for it. So thank you, thank you team one. All right, drum roll again. Um, second place is uh, team eight, deep brain stimulation. So congratulations. <laughs> So for Team 8, we were particularly impressed with the design and the rigor of the, of the statistical methods that you guys used. Um, you were uh, among the top for code quality as well, so, uh, so good job with that. Um, we also liked the fact that you were able to, um, to do a really good job nailing down the conclusion that there are more relationships among neurons in the alert state. Um, this was a, c a conclusion that several teams reached, but we thought that you guys did the best job of supporting this conclusion. All right, and now um, the absolute uh, biggest and longest drum roll for the first place team. Team six, vicious and delicious. Um, Side. I don't think they got it. <laughs> oh man. Did you, did you hear? So. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So team, team sex, wishes and delicious. Did you hear that? Okay, they're very faint, they did. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So uh, virtual handshake to team six. And we'll send you virtual laser send, pointers. Yeah, we'll send you, the, send you virtual <laughs> swag. We'll, yeah, we'll yeah, email yeah, you the we'll laser pointers. All right. Um, yeah, can you take a photo of the laptop for a second? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here we go. Great. There we go. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right. So team six. One of the things that we really liked was that you guys identified um, an interesting and novel and actionable biological result, um, which was the morphological difference in synapses between the wild type and heterozygous mice. Um, and that was a conclusion that was unique to your group, right? So many of the other conclusions were reached by multiple groups, but this was one that, that you were the only group to discover. Um, and this was supported by a well-designed statistical method. Um, we also liked your explicit analysis of the pairwise statistical interactions through the mutual information and very cool but perhaps less conclusive, the Chow Lu tree. So um, good job uh, to team six and good job to everybody. Thank you so much for participating. Again, we were hugely impressed with the, um, with the contributions that everybody made. So big round of applause for everybody again. Thanks again, everybody, for participating.